say I got five minutes of their perspective on online education and the changes in higher education. Uh, we have one person in the department at UBC, another person outside the department at UBC, someone, an academic, not from UBC, and then a university recruiter. So let me introduce our panelists, and I thank them all for participating. First, our department member, Gregor Gonzalez. He's a pioneer in aspect-oriented programming. He's an ACM fellow. More recently, he's worked very hard to re-engineer our introductory course, and he's offering a version of that course as a move on the Coursera platform in a couple of days. It's more than a couple of days. <laughs> Mary Lynn Young is a professor of journalism in the Graduate School of Journalism here at UBC. She has um, a lot of experience as a editor and reporter for national dailies uh, in both Canada and the United States. And she's currently a, an associate dean of arts for strategy and something. Communications. Strategy and communications. Both uh, Gregor and Mary Lynn are active within UBC in helping UBC sort of map out its own strategies for going forward. I think you all know Maria, if you were at the last <laughs> talk. Um, I think uh, she's currently president of Harvey Mudd. I think any university president has to be thinking about these issues. Also relevant is that when Maria was here, and she mentioned it briefly, interactive education technologies is actually one of our original research passions. And I'm sure she brings that passion to this issue as well. And then someone outside universities, just to make it fun, we thought it'd be great to get the perspective of a university recruiter. How is it that university recruiting is going to change? What will companies be looking for in new graduates or even non-new graduates? Are credentials going to be the same? What is taking a MOOC class for credit let's say, in an advanced networking course, going to buy you in terms of how a recruiter would look at that. So we uh, hope to get the perspective of Mike Kasser. He's a university recruiter for Facebook. And he's actually our liaison here at BBC. Um, and he has extensive experience recruiting for all kinds of technology companies. So, uh, and he himself has seen the changes already. So we really look forward to that. So. We're going to go to the next phase. I'm going to hand it over to our panelists. And then I'll tell you what happens after that. So um, I think I'm just going to go around the horn. And we'll start with Gregor. I don't think so. <laughs> Do I have to hold the microphone? Or you can use the mic. Just turn it on. Uh, OK. I, just got, I brought a couple slides, and I want to show you a couple pictures. So sorry, Bill. The first thing I'm going to do is, is lead on the title of the panel, because that's the first thing a good panelist does. Look, what I'm going to say is it's not about the MOOCs, and it's not about the end of the university. If you characterize it the first way, the problem becomes too narrow. And if you characterize it the second way, well, it's apocalyptic, and so people can ignore you. What it's about is it's about de-aggregating the services provided by universities. So what do I mean by that? You know, right now, kind of the way what we do works is the student puts in some money, and the government puts in some money, and some years go by, hopefully four, hopefully less than eight. <laughs> <laughs> and all of this stuff happens. Okay, so there's content learning, and there's skill learning, and there's certification, and there's assessment, and there's acculturation, and there's drinking beer, and there's kind of all of that. And it all matters. And in the past, we have enjoyed a near monopoly license to do this, except for the beer part. Other people share that license. <laughs> um, we've enjoyed a near monopoly license to do this. And that license was not given to us by God. It was given to us by government and society. And the real thing that's happening is that monopoly license is breaking down. Government and students are willing to go other places for parts of this. And so when that happens, when a big sector disaggregates, people outside the sector see it as an opportunity. We see it as a, they see it as an opportunity. So what I want to do is talk about it, the perspective from outside for just a bit. What they see is they see, gee, you're kind of taking money for all of this, and I bet there's some places in there where you're taking more than you really deserve to get. And we all know, of course, that one of our liabilities is that we fund this off of revenue for that. 
And from the inside, that's great. That's how universities work. That's how they help society. From the outside, let's look at it a different way. Let's consider calculus 101. Now, of course, I could have said CS5, but I didn't because it's much, I, 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 it's a little, it's a little too close to home. <laughs> <laughs> so calculus, in some universities, the classes are large. Sometimes they're even taught by postdocs. And the interesting thing is students pay the same for that service as they pay for a fourth year class with 25 students. So they're paying roughly 2K per course, still a great deal. Now remember, we get 500 in tuition, but it really costs them about 2K. Now, I'm sitting outside of BC and I do a little bit of math and I say, gee, you know, what if 1 million students in North America per year take calculus? That's one quarter of that age pool. So maybe that's a big number, I don't know. And what if, say, half a dozen big calculus courses could split 80% of the market and charge those students $50, which is roughly what Coursera is charging now for signature track courses. Coursera is charging almost $200 for credit. How good a calculus course do you think you could make if your annual recurring development budget is $1 million? <laughs> You think you could do better than we do now? Let me show you what you can do if your, if your budget is a tenth of that. So this is the Penn Calculus course. This is taught by a fairly serious mathematician. Not perhaps the world's best, but this is taught by you know, a guy with a lot of papers and a pretty big impact number. And he decided that the slides were going to look great. So that's what he did. And you may think that the slides don't need to look that great. Maybe that's just something to you. I don't know. This is a course from UBC on climate studies in which the slides were done by a team of people who left EA and are now doing visualiz scientific visualization. And they're basically showing hey, the planet's getting hotter. <laughs> now, I can't afford to do either of those things if it's all me by myself. I mean, you, just don't, you just don't have the time to do that. But if your budget's $100,000, or it's a million dollars a year, you can start to do more of this, and it matters. If you look at the online evaluation of these courses, students really like them, and they don't like them because they're easy. That calculus course is apparently quite difficult. Now, you could say, well, student evaluations, da 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 da, da but we live on student evaluations here, so don't, don't criticize student evaluations too much. So that's one opportunity. That's kind of coming up from below. That's sort of taking off the bottom, the service courses. Let me show you another one from the top. This is a thing called Institute U. And these people's perspective is that 48% of the students who start four-year college in North America do not complete in six years. They're saying that that's not working for those students. And so their goal is to pace, oh, it's all in the language of opportunity, right? Because whenever you attack the established establishment, you have to use the language of opportunity. So it's all in the language of opportunity. Oh, they've set a small goal for themselves. They're going to reach 5% of the non-degree completing students. So they're going to graduate half a million students by 2025. Now, you know, they're probably not going to make that goal. But, but what I'm showing you here is if you start piecing this thing apart, you can come at it from lots of perspectives. You can come from the bottom, you can come from the top. That's what those two are. So what do we have to do? We have to do the thing Bill alluded to. We have to look at it as if we were from the outside, and we have to say, okay, fine. If they're going to take advantage of technology to make better things than have ever existed before, so are we. We're going to take advantage of technology to make a better education than has ever existed before. In-house. We're probably going to have to cede some part of the territory in order to do it. We're probably going to have to cede some part of the territory in order to do it. But the question is, what are the pieces of the territory that we can do better than everything before. Just to give you a sense of what thinking out of the box might be, here's one idea. We take all of our first two years, and there's no more lectures. It's all a cohort program, and it's all problem solving. We basically say, listen, before you shop in class, go see these three, these three moves. Get your content learning done, and now we're going to do stuff. See what I'm doing here? I'm basically trying to respond to both of those original threats. Probably a bad idea to try to respond to two threats at once, but I only had five minutes and I need more than that. 
I'm basically trying to do the cohort entrepreneurship thing, and I'm trying to make to get away from big boring lectures. We could maybe have three kinds of cohort. I'm not so much proposing this idea as I'm asking the alumni in particular in the room for help and also tell us what we should do. Please don't tell us how what you remember so fondly about when you were here. I mean, that kind of makes us feel good and it's nice. So you can whisper that in our ear for a couple minutes, it's good. But when you're done that, tell us how our current graduates aren't good enough. Tell us how the people you hired last year weren't good enough. Tell us how we can make them better than they've ever been before. Because we have an opportunity here to respond to this challenge. And I think we have to think about it from the outside and say, well, what aren't we doing? What could we do better? We've never been challenged like this before. We are now, but I actually think we can win if we think about it aggressively. So I'm trying to make this to black. <laughs> about what happened to another monopoly industry faced with disruptive technologies um, from my experience as a journalist. And so I'm going to use my five minutes to talk about three things that I learned over the past decade, basically, when journalism was faced with digital disruption. The first learning I had was that the impact of digital technologies on journalism was surprising and painful for legacy institutions, and also full of possibilities for users and new practitioners. A number of factors led to this learning. First, legacy news organizations tended to be defensive cultures. And, and some of this may or may not ring true uh, with what's happening in the universities. I've tried to think about uh, my role as, as an administrator here in doing this. With limited contributions to R&D, news organizations were largely R&D resistant. We thought we had all the answers and we didn't need to be thinking about innovation in terms of how we did what we did. For the latter part of the 20th century, revenue growth and growth were relatively assured as was the place of the mainstream journalist in public discourse. There was a level of professional hubris that we were important, and that declining circulation, which had been starting prior uh, to the end of the century, was a problem that could still be addressed. When newspapers started to proliferate on the web in the late 1990s and early 2000s, journalists were still thinking, well, how do we cross-promote? How do we still maintain what we do, but sort of take advantage of the digital environment? It wasn't really how digital was going to radically transform what we did, but it was how it was going to allow us to do what we did um, on a different platform. The problem that the industry identified was largely how to add technology and mix, uh, not to radically transform the experience for the citizen or the consumer. Appointment journalism, which is what we called reading the newspaper in the morning, watching the 6 o'clock news, or listening to the radio on the way uh, to or from the office, was still highly intact and still the norm. This focus and a number of these factors ended up creating a large blind spot, in part because the media had constructed audiences as lacking in agency and lacking the will to actually be interested or to walk away from their services and products as they were construed. At the same time, however, news consumers, citizens, public intellectuals, and others we're looking for other ways to engage with the public, with the mainstream media. There was a lot of criticism, or to simply bypass them in terms of public discourse. We saw the beginnings of the blogosphere, political and entertainment sites such as Gawker in 2003, Huffington Post in 2005, and others using their single blogs as experts, commentators, and competing with journalists, gathering large audiences on their own without the problems of legacy, um, legacy operational costs. And so individuals were actually able to communicate to these groups on their own, and an abundance of content was created across a wider set of platforms. So the second learning I had is that change happened slowly, at least during this period, yet inexorably in key areas related to the value of our work, what we did well as journalists, and who was valued for that labor. Both of those changed over this period. The disruptors, as we know, went after the low-end, homogenous news content, the bread and butter of any mainstream journalism, journalism organization, you know, the events that are covered over and over and over again. For instance, the Ford 
uh, I don't know if anyone's following the Twitter uh, feed on the Ford scandal in Toronto or the Ford and all the newspapers. I mean, it's the same story in every newspaper. And so the, the new disruptors went after that, and rightfully so. And this had an impact on the already in decline uh, legacy organizations around circulation. Competing sites started with the lower barriers to entry, and they didn't have the legacy labor cost to deal with, so they were much more nimble, much more diverse, and much more able to focus on faster content, more personalized content, no legacy overhead, and creating new markets. So it was this buildup of energy. Um, as media economist Robert Picard says, we saw a declining value of traditional news and informational content in this period, which was on reflection um, when compared globally relatively homogenous. So on reflection, journalists had to see that the content really wasn't all that special. Paradoxically, new and bigger talent started to emerge in the mainstream media. So we always had columnists, we always had people like um, Peter Mansbridge out there, but the digital landscape allowed new kinds of bigger global talent individuals to emerge. However, these talent pools also reified gender, race, class structures in terms of who was able to speak and how they were able to speak. And there's a, a new literature on that which may be relevant in terms of uh, the talent pool that might emerge from MOOCs as they sort of get global reach. The third and final thing that I discovered was that journalists, we didn't wake up one afternoon and decide that we have it all wrong, as you know, Gregor's, I think, rightfully advocating that we think about right now, or you know, how can we do it differently. Instead, we thought we were pretty smart people, and we decided we were going to manage through this. We were capable of managing through this on our own. Managing through, however, was a lot more difficult than we thought, um, because we had such an investment in the old culture the old power relations, the old norms, the old pra practices, the ways that we all learned and were acculturated in terms of doing things and socialized. So resistance, attachment, inability to imagine alternatives, and threat to existing power structures really inhibited, in inhibited the legacy media's ability to innovate in this space. Uh, and the biggest losers in this trajectory were already the ones at the lower end, the middle end of the path, and the ones who are already struggling. The, the good news is that the high-end institutions, the New York Times, some of the stronger brands, still manage to come through and do relatively well, although there are um, still existing uh, financial challenges. Finally, one of the big losses for mainstream media is that, and this is probably a good segue to our next speaker, is that we lost the power to be the sole monopoly gatekeepers to public discourse. And now, when you look at the studies, social media, social networks are one of the main places that citizens, consumers, individuals are actually getting access to their news. So I leave you all with that. Hopeful, perhaps not. <laughs> Students are in the room? Current students? Okay. Uh, I'm just getting a sense. So um, I'll start with a question. In a, in, a, in a future where everyone has access to unlimited information through things like these MOOCs, um, the internet, uh, social media, um, will industries still go to, still look to universities and colleges to hire talent? Well, they still look at that as a place to go. So I'll leave that question, and I'm actually going to step away from that for a second and ask you to put yourself in the shoes of a university recruiter. We're going to pretend that we're all university recruiters for a moment, and we, we're hiring, we're actually out looking to hire an entry level software engineer, and we've identified two candidates, and we only have the ability to interview one of them. One candidate, candidate A, has a, is a is graduating senior, they have a bachelor's degree, and computer science, and they have a 4.0 GPA. Candidate B, same, same background, bachelor's degree, senior, graduating, but they have a 3.0 GPA. Choice of which one that you would interview? Anybody? It's an easy one. This is a soft one question. <laughs> Go with 4.0, right? Um, it's easy. Let's add some parameters. Um, um, let's say that same candidate A, 4.0 GPA, also, they have some class projects that they've worked on. 
listed on their resume. And um, one of them is a Facebook, Twitter, um, newsfeed mashup. Um, and candidate B, still 4.0 GPA, candidate B, 3.0 GPA, they have class projects, but they also have an internship at a tech company. And maybe they also have um, some code that they contributed to an open source project listed on their resume. You can actually go and see what they did. In that case, the choice becomes which one you go with, right? So these are the kinds of things that university recruiters are looking at on a daily basis. And I think the sorts of things that are the way that these, these new outlets for education um, could potentially disrupt the way um, we're actually recruiting people, and we're already seeing it happen. So um, if you go into a little bit more detail about those parameters, GPA, um, you know, it shows that someone's a hard worker. Um, if, they're, if they're doing well in their classes, sure, we should go after that candidate. Um, uh, classroom projects, um, perhaps um, they can be they can be really useful to look at, um, but it really depends on what finding out more about what that candidate actually did in terms of like interacting in that project. Um, an example that I'll give is I was looking at um, resumes from um, a particular school in a particular program and. They all, all had the same exact class project. It was like 20 resumes, and they all had the same project on it. It was the same, and the same wording almost. And it's like, well, then it doesn't really help if everybody has the same thing. Um, so then you have to go in and find out more about what they've done. Um, the internship, obviously, that's a very key one. Um, it's good because it shows experience. Um, that, that, that maybe this candidate um, has had experience. They've gone into, the, they've gone into work every day, and contributed to making something happen, um, shipping code, um, learning how to, learning how to interact in, in, um, in the industry. Um, the final thing that I think, and this is the area where I think that this sort of thing can really be useful, and the things that we're gonna be looking at is the things that are in this kind of outside of, outside of things that are required in your classes. Um, are you contributing to open source projects? Um, have, do you have an iPhone or an Android app that we can look at? Um, did you take a look? Um, and, um, and interesting, I, I went and I talked to some of um, our interns this week um, and asked them what they thought about these. Have they done? Have they taken any of these classes online? Um, and they had, like all of them had, um, which I was like, this is awesome. Um, so, um, and they had some varying opinions about what the usefulness of them. Um, one student in particular, he. Um, he is from Egypt, and he has several friends, and there he took some of them, you know, just outside of class. But he has several friends that are in Egypt that are taking these, taking these massive open online courses um, as their main source of education at this point, because for whatever reason, financial, whatever reason, they're unable to go to a Western university or a major university and study, so they're doing it on their own. So this is just, it's going, it's happening already. Um, Another student said that he uses it kind of like a Wikipedia or like a reference. So if he needs to like figure out something that he's working on, he'll go and take a portion of that class or review that class in order to get the bit of information that he needs to move on to the next thing. He's not looking at it as I need to take this class for credit. Um, taking it, what, taking these things to the next step of are they eventually going to be um, are they going to be things that are used for credit and will will say Facebook say well. If, you have this certificate from Coursera, um, that's just as good as a, as a degree from UBC. Who knows? I, mean, I, think it's, I think the future, I think there's still a lot of things that need to pan out there. I think universities are really good at offering um, kind of an in-depth experience. Um, and I think the career services and the co-op programs are something that are not, they, they're, starting to, they're starting to have them in these, in, in, in Coursera and these sorts of um, startup companies, um, but they're not anywhere where they are in terms of with the university. So for the foreseeable future, I think that that um, that tech companies will continue to look at universities as a main source for their entry level talent for sure. Um, but obviously, everything's being disrupted, and there's also other interesting disruptions that are probably ha that are going to be happening concurrently on in the recruiting world. One of them is going to be resumes. Uh, I think that the paper resume is going to go the way of the dodo hopefully soon. Um, um, uh, I also read from, was researching Coursera, and apparently now they're offering to show um, industry candidates that have higher scores on these classes 
So they're like offering up, you know, here's access to the students that are doing the best in these classes. So that'll be something that'll be interesting to see a little pan out. It's really in its, in its infancy right now. Um, from a company like a Facebook's perspective, of course we're open to anything. Um, our founder actually dropped out of Harvard. So um, we're not, we don't necessarily need the degree. We're looking for the skills. We're looking for people who can use software, software engineers, people who are big coders, who are problem solvers, and who are team players. So um, we're willing to look at other sources for that, of course. But I think that it's, it's a, I think everything comes along with it. It's not just one or the other. So that's my perspective. So, okay. Thanks. I think probably most of you uh, know that there was a president at the University of Virginia who was um, basically fired by the board because they felt she wasn't being uh, aggressive enough in moving towards using technology in education. And um, the faculty and uh, staff at the University of Virginia protested this and they retired her something like three weeks after this happened. But I had an interesting conversation with uh, John Mitchell at Stanford, who is their uh, vice provost for online learning and, and a very long computer scientist. And his comment was that while all of this was happening, he'd gone in to talk to John Hennessy, the president at Stanford, and, and he said, can you believe they fired her? They obviously don't realize that we don't have a clue what we're doing with MOOCs. We're just exploring. It's very early stages. I also have the... the um, pleasure of uh, serving on the visiting committee for undergraduate education at MIT and uh, I got to hear their perspective and why they started edX and essentially they were terrified by what was going on at Stanford and just were desperately trying to catch up. So um, I also was at the advisory committee for the School of Engineering at Stanford last month and they basically feel that uh, the the manic phase of MOOCs is passing. And the, you know, the, they were talking about the fact that online learning, and, and Bill made this point, there's been online learning for as long as there's been online, and there have been many, many waves of people saying this is the end of life as we know it. And certainly while I was at UBC, there was all this conversation about how everything was going to go online, it was going to disrupt the university experience, and et cetera, et cetera. So let me talk about it. Uh, from the perspective of money. So we have a board retreat every, uh, every year um, for a couple of days in early November. It's in Palm Springs. That's for some historic reason. Very nice ranch. And uh, we decided that the theme this year would be emerging technologies in higher education and the potential impact on Harvard New College. And so we had uh, spent two days talking about this both. We had a couple of people, uh, Jane and Chris Manning, uh, from Stanford come and talk about what they were doing with MOOCs and their perspective. We have um, a, four faculty at MUD who have an NSF grant to compare the learning outcomes for uh, teaching a class using uh, a flipped classroom where the students all watch number of short videos before each class, and then they spend their entire time in the classroom doing group problem solving. Uh, and in this case, all four faculty are teaching two sections of the same course, one flipped and one regular, and comparing both how the students uh, react to this and how, um, and how the learning outcomes are. We had a presentation on the digital humanities, uh, initiative, which is something that is shared across the Claremont Colleges. We had a um, uh, presentation about one of our faculty members, Francis Sue, who allowed his uh, real analysis course uh, to be filmed and posted on YouTube, not because he wanted to do it, but because we had two students who were developing uh, a, uh, an application called LearnStream, where you could annotate video, and they needed to have some video to annotate. And so um, they persuaded Francis that he would allow them to film uh, all of his lectures. And it got posted on YouTube, and I think has maybe 100,000 views at this point. And apparently he's, there are people wearing t-shirts with Francis Sue on them in Sierra Leone. I mean, it's a very popular way to learn <laughs> analysis, and it is the lowest production values 
videos you can possibly now uh, imagine. Anyhow, we had um, lots of discussions, extremely interesting. And in the end, uh, and, we, and we had some trustees and some spouses of trustees who were sort of going, of course we should start a Harvard Mike College online. We could have tens of thousands of students instead of 750. And you know, you can't miss this. This is this is the boat that's leaving or the train or something. <laughs> but you know, the bottom line for us is our learning is not done in lectures like this. Our learning is done in groups of students working together with faculty. And if we if you actually analyze the amount of time that faculty spend, probably less than 30% for any faculty member is spent, spent preparing lectures and giving lectures. And all the other time is spent working with students one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And we truly believe that the vast majority of the learning happens at Harvey My College. It's not about sitting in lectures. It's about the work you do to solve problems. And as I said, the vast majority of that happens in, in teams. So we decided that, you know, probably doing MOOCs at Harvey Mudd College for a bunch of other undergraduate students or people around the world, is that's probably not our sweet spot. We decided that we would do two MOOCs, but we'd aim them at high school students. And we have funding from Bill Gates to do this. We're doing one about principles for computer science, which is going to be the new AP course, and we're doing one for AP Physics C. Now, why did we decide to do this? The first thing is those are the two AP courses that are hardest to get. There are a lot of schools that don't have teachers who are qualified to offer them. And our idea is we're not just doing the standard kind of MOOC where you, know, you see a hand writing across the board or you see fancy slides or whatever. We're actually going to be filming real teachers teaching real students. And we're going to film it in a school where, well, for at least a CS class, where virtually every student is of color. We're going to do it in Pomona, which is, you know, it's basically half and half African American and Hispanic students. We're going to have a lot of the people doing the short videos be females and African Americans and students, you know, so that we're role modeling not what you would expect to see in computer science and physics C. For physics C, we're going to put, physics C is mechanics with calculus, okay? And we think that a lot of, we're going to actually film our faculty teaching our mechanics class. But then we're going to have a whole bunch of student videos that provide backup for the mathematics that you need. And what we're thinking is that for our actual students at MUD, having access to these kinds of resources is going to be very helpful. But you know, I'm sure there will be a few students who sign up to take one of these courses. They'll be available fall 2014, so a year and a bit from now. There'll be a few students who sign up to take it because they can't get it at their class at their own school. And then they can write the AP exam and they can get credit for it that way. So, I mean, it allows us to sidestep that entire issue of, of giving credit. But we think the biggest resource will be that if you're a teacher who wants to teach a physics class or a CS class and you don't really have the background for it, you can use as much or as little of our resources as you want. You can have all of the student assignments graded online. Or you can create your own assignments. And so, you know, for our perspective, um, we're doing something good for the world, hopefully. We're providing access to students who wouldn't have access, but even more importantly, access to teaching role models to faculty who wouldn't, teachers in schools who wouldn't usually have that. We're increasing our visibility and we're showing off our amazing students who I'll just tell you, they're like my very favorite Canadian undergraduate students. They're really bright, they're really nice, they work really hard and they help each other. And we're raising our visibility among the group that we most want to know about us high school teachers and students. So that's the path that we're taking right now. We think about possibly using, I mean, one of the problems about MUD is it's hard for our students to do study abroad because we have such a specialized curriculum. But So we're thinking about the possibility that we might allow students who are studying abroad to do some online version of the course. But I'm pretty sure that for us, the most important thing will be person-to-person -person communication and collaboration. 
And I think, like Gregor, we are trying to look at what we can use technology for to strengthen the learning experience. And I will say, I have yet to meet an employer who has told us that mothers weren't the best possible thing they could hire as they are. <laughs> something um, that new classrooms are supposed to do. We're not supposed to lecture at you for 80 minutes at a time. You're supposed to get involved. You're supposed to talk with each other and problem solve. So for the next 10 minutes, I want you to break up into groups of three to four. Like on this side, I think each of these rows breaks up into one or two groups. Over here, I'm thinking each row is like, well, the big rows, two or three groups. So groups of three or four. And I want you to talk about all the stuff you've heard. But take it from a personal perspective. You're a parent. And, you know, are you going to be willing to pay the same revenue, uh, the same tuition, if you know that half the intro courses are really just videos from some famous person with a whole lot of else going on by some high paid professor? What? What added value do you want out of a course like that before you're willing to pay the extra revenue? You work at a company. What are you looking for in new employees? You're managing your own career. How will MOOCs affect how you do that? So think about these issues from your own personal perspective, if you can. Argue with each other about if half the universities in North America are going to go out of business because of this disruptive technology. Um, argue about whatever you like, but take it from a personal perspective. We'll do this for about 10 minutes. Everyone think they have enough fun and engagement in this to do this with each other and argue? Yeah? Okay, let's get to it. Um, we're going to uh, try something a little bit different than the typical panel where somebody stands up and asks a question. Um, mostly because we think uh, for this kind of topic, you don't actually want to ask a question. You have an opinion you want to state. Uh, and it's a little bit more fun. So we're going to use a format called a fishbowl. In a fishbowl, um, to say anything, you have to sit in a chair. And uh, so I'm going to be standing over there. If you want to sit in a chair, just come stand around here. And uh, maybe you want to tell me if you want to respond to someone in, in particular or not. Um, but that's, that's what you got to do to get into the conversation. And now you're all super primed. You all have ideas. So, um, and then if there are kind of fewer chairs, then there are people who want to speak. That's okay, we'll kind of gently nudge some people out of chairs and, uh, and try to continue the conversation. Sound good? Everyone got the idea? I still have empty you know, room for more, more people. Okay. So if, if, uh, as you sit down, why don't you um, give us your name and then... Um, Here's the mic. Uh, My name is Ducky Sherwood. I have three degrees. I have seven transcripts. I have a lot of distance learning uh, courses that I've taken over the past 30 years. Um, and I came down because I wanted to respond to something that Gregor said. One of the things that I absolutely agree with you about the list of things that universities do, uh, I actually wrote something very similar to that 20 years ago. Uh, one of the things that I think is very important that is not on your list and that I think people overlook, the thing that mattered most as to whether I stayed in a course or not, or whether I just dropped it, was did someone care if I showed up or not? And that's one of the things that universities can do, that they have people who see if you are sitting in the seat or not. I don't know how you do that online unless you have uh, active mailing lists or forums.
forums or something where people are contributing on a regular basis and need to contribute on a regular basis. That's all. So let me just say something quick about that. The first is, make no mistake, if you pay one-tenth as much, you're not going to get the same. And some of the things you're going to lose are going to be those personal things. On the other hand, when you've got a million dollars here to produce a course, what's going to happen is you're going to have this huge web of problems. And any time a student makes any particular mistake on a problem, you're going to have machine learning fixing this. You take the machine learning fixing this and you sprinkle it over everything and it's good. <laughs> you're going to have some machine learning thing that plays for them the right piece of video that explains exactly the mistake that the insightful TA would have said. Now, you know, it's not going to be quite as good. I don't think anybody thinks the airlines are anywhere near as good as they used to be. But nobody wants to go back to paying twice as much for fewer flights. So it, the question is not whether it's as good. The question is, it, is, is the price point winning? And one tenth the price is a pretty good discount. I'm going to let Allah come in. No, 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 you don't have to leave until someone takes you out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was so dropped into the whole thing as being known as opinionated enough <laughs> and had a strong opinion about the whole thing. And, uh, yeah, say my name. Uh, okay. I'm have you met your name? Thank <laughs> you. 
with 175,000 people on a MOOC. Um, second point was a business that I started seven years ago as a result of meeting with Bill. Um, and this isn't an ad business. Um, but it required developing software. And because I was working at the time with postgraduate students in computer science, it seemed reasonable to hire computer science students to do the program. So I hired a couple of uh, PhD students, uh, one in particular to do the software. And it took about a year before I really discovered that he couldn't program. Um, well, I, I, you could program to make things happen, but from an industrial point of view, what he created um, was not worth anything, and actually it was over a year, and all his efforts were thrown out. So, again, we're um, talking to another point that was made, I think, by Gregor, which is the need to combine the theoretical with the practical. And maybe some of that can be done with MOOCs without the university. But if you combine all three of the points that I've just made, which is the, the learning through MOOCs, the uh, supervisory experience, and the practical experience, then I think you'll end up with students that are far superior than most that we are able to graduate today. Why don't you just pass it to your right? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrew Holley. I'm a recent EPCCS graduate um, about two years ago, uh, working in the Zen. And um, what was interesting to me uh, in the discussion before, talking about the uh, possibility of uh, as moves become more prevalent, for students who, um, for people who don't or can't attend traditional university for whatever reason, taking moves to learn about, you know, about talk about computer science, contributing to a few open source projects, doing a project of their own, and on the strength of this, getting hired by you know, like paper or you know, whatever tech companies. Um, and the question this raised in my mind is uh, how that kind of self-education using MOOCs and other such resources uh, might affect the um, graduate education pipeline. In, uh, so this is a question that those of you who have who are involved with the academic side of things, uh, you think there might be a possibility in the future that these kinds of things might lead to people applying on the strength of this to graduate programs or these things might become involved in teaching graduate courses, graduate courses or become involved in other uh, forms of graduate education. Um, so this is an open to any question to any of you who have uh, some thoughts on that. There's a different thing I was going to say in response to. Let me just say a quick thing response to all of Look, I'm not, I'm not a big champion of those things. I would gladly wake up tomorrow and not be in this spot. I lost one career to the disaggregation of a business because it was disrupted by an inferior product. Okay? Xerox got destroyed by a $99 printer. I'd be perfectly happy to have it go away, but it's not going to go away. If you want to keep education great and keep it great in the ways that it's great now, we got to do this thing. Standing there and saying it's no good isn't going to work because it's, it's better than no good. students, so that means the fraction that normally go off to graduate school, it would be the same fraction of a smaller number. I, I worry about it, graduate training and research in general, because Gregor said it, uh, in, in most universities uh, in North America, some of the research dollars actually subsidize, effectively subsidize undergraduate education. Certainly that's true. The research dollars subsidize education. It's, it's in, 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 I would claim in Canada, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I need a movie. Um, yeah, so the, the education dollars 
subsidize the research. Um, and in Canada, it's much more true than in the United States. Um, so I worry that if some of the money, as Gregor was talking about, gets disaggregated and little pieces of it start going to other places other than universities, universities get smaller because they don't have as much money, they don't have as many professors, and, and less research gets done for society. In the same way that the effects of scaling and the hollowing out of the middle in journalism affected the quality of journalism. There are just fewer journalists who are doing high quality journalism because there's not as much money for that activity as there used to be. So I very much worry about the future of the research enterprise as it's affected by these lower cost scaling technologies. So I answer to make another point related to the, to the research. If we look at the research industry, if I want to call it that, throughout, let's say, Canada or North America, is it designed to be most efficient? When you look at research going on in a lot of different universities um, and compare that with the quality of research that uh, may be going on um, in um, the up perimeter institute, if you like, in, in pure physics, could, it, could the research not be done more efficiently by centering it? That's a whole different panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think if you want to answer that, and then... No, 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 I, I want to make it different. Okay. So I do think one really beneficial thing that MOOCs will have is if you're a crap instructor, like the one that you had in mathematical engineering, there's no justification for you teaching that course. So I do think that one thing that, will, that MOOCs will force is that universities will have to take undergraduate teaching very seriously, and in particular, take undergraduate teaching in a way that, even if you're teaching to 200 or 600 students, really engages the students in active learning. I think that's exactly right. And what you're going to see right now, the big American schools can recruit a superstar researcher and pay them huge dollars. In three years, superstar teachers are going to start to be recruitable in that same way. Because they're going to have this whole brand on their room. We uh, unfortunately do have to start wrapping up, um, but Kelly nicely decided to take a chance and come back here. So. <laughs> Kelly Booth, it's been years since I've been able to argue with Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. So I thought a lot of the analyses, especially Gregor's, was very good. But I noticed that they're all economic, and then I heard the E word used, efficiency. And you know, we live in a world where those things are increasingly important. The universities are now what being run as far as I can see by MBAs. I mean, they've always been businesses. People who say they aren't true, they just, you know, they missed out. But they are, they've always been businesses, but they've been a different kind of business. And I think it's interesting that we didn't hear anything really about is this going to make better students. We got a little bit of the discussion towards the end there, which I was happy to hear but it's all from sort of the money and supplier side. And we also hear that, well, why is it we have higher education and this and that and everything, and it's always traditionally supposed to be something about quality of life and creating better citizens for society, et cetera. And I think these are actually really big issues. And I do worry that the sort of uniformity, everybody using what's effectively the same textbook, uh, everybody getting the same lectures, and if you read the article that was recently circulated, the faculty got copies, but it's online of the reaction of the philosophy department at San Jose State, where they point out that especially their school has very diverse ethnic uh, and cultural background, and they didn't feel, especially on a course on social justice, which is what they were buying from uh, Harvard, uh, from Harvard, yeah, that that this was an appropriate experience for their students. So I think there's a lot of other issues there, and they do get clouded up when everybody's looking at, you know, when are we going to IPO our university or get bought out by Google? That's not an argument. I agree with you. <laughs> Jane, you hit her in slot. <laughs> Nobody agrees.
really knows what the future holds, but this is a fun and at least to many of us important topic. And I hope you all keep talking about it. And, and let me just echo something Gregor said. Uh, as a department uh, in particular, but certainly as a university, um, we want really to know what we should be doing better. And the people, I think, who are among the best able to do that for us are our alumni. So you really have to help us help us uh, figure out what we did well, what we can do better uh, going forward. So thank you all really for being here and participating.